Okay, good morning everyone and Hazak Baruch, thank you for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday morning and wishing everyone over here a happy Pesach Sheni. Happy second Passover, hope you all had uh, have your matzahs ready. Beautiful custom to have some matzah today as we celebrate the Pesach Sheni holiday. It is a holiday today. We said Yehishem in the prayer, we didn't do the Vidui, we didn't do Anna, which always makes us happier when we don't have to do the Vidui, especially if it falls out on a Monday or Thursday. But either way, today is a holiday, um, and if it was the times of the Temple, uh, it would be even bigger holiday. What exactly is Pesach Sheni? What is the source of Pesach Sheni? Pesach Sheni, to understand what today is all about, we turn to the Perasha of Beha'alotecha. Okay, we're going to actually read it in a few weeks from now. It's uh, the third perasha in the book of Bamidbar. So please turn to the book of Bamidbar. And let us turn to chapter 9. Chapter 9, where we are <clears throat> in the desert, and we're one year after we left Egypt. So this is the one year anniversary of Pesach. And God says to Moshe, make sure the Jewish people do Korban Pesach this year. Actually, it's a very interesting fact, FYI, I don't know if you knew this, but for 40 years in the desert, take a guess, how many Pesachs did we celebrate? 40 years in the desert. Only one. Correct. <clears throat> we only did one. Okay? And why is not for now, but we only did one of 40 years. For 39 years, the Jewish people did not do Korban Pesach. But at least on the first one, the first year anniversary, <clears throat> we were one year after we left Egypt, and we're still by Har Sinai, by the way. We're, um, we're right there. We just, uh, Pasuk says, Bemidbar Sinai. We were in the Sinai Desert. Bashana Hashanit. In the second year from leaving Egypt. Bahodesh Harishon. This is one, the first month. Nisan. <clears throat> literally 12 months after we left Egypt. God says to Moshe, <clears throat> make sure on the 14th, you bring the Korban Pesach. And on the 15th, you eat it. And here we go. Vahi Anashim. Pasuk says that there were some people. Asher hayu temeim lenefesh adam. That they were <clears throat> impure. Now we know a very interesting halakha that in order to eat korban Pesach, yeah, you have to, to eat any korban, you have to be tahor. You have to be tahor, you have to be pure. Now what happens if you're impure? If you're impure, then you have to wait till you're pure. Problem is, problem is that sometimes <clears throat> you cannot wait. Like as an example, Pesach. Pesach, you cannot eat it next week. The day is the holiday. The 15th is the 15th. So there were some people that they were Tameh on that day. They were Tameh on the 15th. And by the way, <clears throat> it's very interesting. Because let's say, I mean, wacko case, you ready? Let's say you have a case where a guy is Tameh on the f 7th till the 14th. So as they're slaughtering the Korban on the 14th in the afternoon... The guy's still Tameh, he's no good. But in the night, he's going to go to the mikveh, he'll be clean in the 15th, right that night, to be able to eat it, he'll be okay. <clears throat> so is he allowed to do the korban? Could you register the guy and have him in mind when you're slaughtering the sheep, knowing that he'll be good tonight? But right now, technically, he's not good yet. But it doesn't matter that he's not good, because the night when he eats it, he will be good. So another interesting question. But either way, Pasuk says that there were people that they were Tameh, and actually, according to Ora Hayim, they were Tameh only, uh, that was their last day, the 14th. They were going to be okay in the night time. But still, the halakha is, you're not allowed to register the guy, if as you're slaughtering the sheep, he's Tameh. So there were some people that were Tameh, and they could not do the Korban Pesach that year, <clears throat> that day. So they come in front of Moshe, they come in front of Aharon, it's the 14th. It's Erev Pesach. Everyone's preparing their, uh, their uh, say their table. Everyone's preparing their ke'ara, making the haroset. You know, the, there was only one, there was only one Pesach program that year. Right? It was the Sinai Peninsula. Okay? There was no uh, Cabo trip. There was no uh, Eden Rock. There was no Greece trip. It was Sinai trip. Okay? That's where everyone was that year. Okay? And then everyone's psyched and preparing and you know, I don't know, burning the chametz. And then there's a few people that are Tameh. They come and they say to Moshe, We are Tameh. We, we were impure. 
Now, what kind of impurity are we talking about? There's different ways of becoming impure. <clears throat> you can become impure um, by touching a dead rat. That's not what we're talking about over here. That's not enough. That wouldn't make you so tame over here. In this case, that would have been fine. Because in the night, you could dip and you're good. This type of tum'ah was a touching a dead body tum'ah. That is the worst level of tum'ah. So they're touching the dead body. And uh, they come and they say to Moshe, we were touching a dead body. Why should we have to lose out? Because we were doing, um, because uh, we were to not, to not be able to bring the sacrifice. Why should we lose out on that? Says the Ora Hayim, what do you mean? Why should you not lose out? That's life. Wait, what's, a, what's the question? I don't understand. <coughs> guy, imagine a guy. <coughs> imagine a guy is sick on Yom Kippur. Your Shana, he didn't come here so far. Uh, it's not fair. I wanted to hear Shofar. Okay, you're right. Is that Hashem next year? You know, Shofar. What, what do you want me to do for you this year? But these people, they came to Moshe with a ta'ana. They came. We want to do it this year. So our rabbis tell us <clears throat> that these people, why, why were they tameh? Why were they impure? It wasn't by choice. There's a few opinions. If you want to see in depth, Masechet Sukkah. For those that have studied it, page, I think, I think it's 25 over there. And the Gemara says over there that um, three opinions of why these people were Tameh. Okay, what are the three opinions? One opinion was that <clears throat> they were Tameh because they were carrying Yosef's coffin. Remember when the Jews left Egypt? They took Yosef's coffin. Yosef told his brothers, when I die and you guys die, and then eventually when we get out of here, Make sure that they take my bones out of this country. I don't want to stay my bones in Egypt. Bury me in Israel. And we know Yosef today is buried in Nablus, in Israel. Uh, it's hard to get to, but uh, he's buried. People have visited, even Jews today have visited Yosef's uh, kever. <clears throat> kever Yosef at Tzadik. He's buried in Israel. But who was carrying his coffin? Jews. Jews were carrying his coffin. They didn't have pallbearers. They, uh, they had Jews. They were carrying the coffin. right? And, uh, and these Jews that were carrying the coffin... They're tamena, now. They're impure. They're impure. And they, they say, that what they're saying is, it's not our fault. We're doing a mitzvah here. We're doing a mitzvah. We're carrying, so we, because we listen to God and we take the thing, we should now lose out on Korban Pesach. It's not, it's not our fault. We didn't choose this. That was, that's one opinion. Another opinion is that they <clears throat> were carrying, not Yosef's bones, but their relatives, their relatives that died. People die throughout the year. Every day of the year, people die. So they had relatives that died in the desert, <clears throat> and they wanted to know. I had, to, I had a mitzvah to bury my, my, my relative. But why should I lose out? Just because I was doing a mitzvah, I don't want to lose out. A third opinion is that if you remember closely, <clears throat> this is actually right after, this is the day that who died? Rosh Chodesh, Nisan, maybe you remember. Who died that day? <clears throat> Rosh Chodesh Nisan, <clears throat> Aaron's two sons. <clears throat> a very sad day, right? So it was their relative, it was their cousins, Mishael and El Safan, that they were carrying out the bodies of Nadav and Avihu from the Holy of Holies. So they took their bodies out. So by by carrying out their body, they became Tameh. So three opinions of who were these people. And it wasn't a lot of people, it was very few people. The majority of the Jewish people were fine, the majority were pure. We're talking about a minority of a minority. And by the way, that's why it says it's singular. Vayhi anashim. There was singular people. It was very few people. If it was a lot of people, Tameh, actually, then there's a law. Tum'ahu tra betzibur. You're allowed to do uh, even korbanot if you're Tameh, as long as the majority are Tameh. Interesting halakha to know. If majority of the Jews are Tameh, then you're allowed to bring korbanot betum'ah. The halakha is overruled. But if it's just a few people, then no, you have to be Tahor. So here it's a few people, and, um, <clears throat> and they're, they're Tameh, they're impure. And they, they come and they say, Moshe, you know, we want to we we be part of this. But Yomer Adehem Moshe, Imduve Ashma, Moshe says, okay, let me see. God never, he never really told me about this one. Uh, let me ask him, is there a makeup? 
you know, you missed the test because you had uh, important shopping to do with your mom. And uh, now you, now you want to make up the test. Can you make it up? By Daber Adonai Moshe Lemor, Daber Ben Israel, God says and comes to tells Moshe the new following halacha, new halacha. Ish, ish, ki yetamela nefesh, if a person is impure, o bederech, or they're far, the asa pesach la donai, the hodesh asheni. So now on the second month of the year, which is iyar, which is the month that we're in, be arbaa asar yom, on the 14th day of that month, which is today, ben ha arbaim yasu oto, al matzot umrorim yochelu. There is a makeup for pesach, believe it or not. And that's what Pesach Sheni is. If you couldn't do it the first time around, you were Tameh, it was too far, whatever the case was, one month later, you could bring a Korban Pesach. Wow. So that is today, my friends, Pesach Sheni. And there are many beautiful lessons that we learned from the story. Lesson number one is that, you know, in life, in life, when something's an opportunity, we want to grab it. We're not happy when we miss opportunities. When something is a hassle, then we try to get out of it. And you see over here that the outlook that these people had at mitzvot, from the fact that they <clears throat> didn't have to do it. They were exempt. They were tameh. They had an excuse. No one's going to punish them. There's no penalty. No one was yelling at them. They understood. You couldn't, you couldn't do the korban pesah. You were sick. If you didn't come to shul, Rabbi calls you up. Where were you in shul? We missed you. Rabbi, I wasn't feeling good. Okay, great. But if we ma, no one's upset at you. Right? You know, sometimes you even, on purpose, you'll text the rabbi. Hey, rabbi, you're not going to be in shul this week. I'm not feeling so good. You know, you just want to, you know, let him know so you know he doesn't yell at you. You know what I mean? Okay, good. No one's yelling at them. They're fine. They were exempt. They were exempt. You have an excuse. But they said, we don't want to be excused. We don't want to be exempt. You only want to be exempt when it's something that you, that you view as a all, as a burden. Mitzvot are not burden. Mitzvot are opportunities. And when it's an opportunity, you don't want to miss it. If a person is sick and he's invited to go to a box uh, Rangers game and he could get amazing seats and then he's sick, he, 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 he's... You're, okay, you're sick. You're, no one's yelling at you. No, but I don't want to be sick. Uh, can I come to the next game? I want to make it up to you. No, you don't have to make it up. I'm not upset. Don't, I'm not yelling. You're sick. I understand. The Rifu Ashlema will have you in mind in the Rifu Ashlema prayer. But the guys, I don't want to be a Rifu Ashlema. I want to be at the game. Could I come with you to the next game? Do you have box tickets next time? Right? Is that the outlook that we have on mitzvot? That's something that we should strive for. That's something that we need to learn today on Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni means that I feel bad. I feel bad I couldn't pray. I wasn't feeling good. I couldn't go to shul. I wish I could. It hurts me. It hurts me. It's raining. You don't have to go to the sukkah. You're exempt. It's raining. I know, but I want to be in the sukkah. Right? Sometimes we get excited. Oh, yes, it's raining. We can eat indoors. Baruch Hashem. Right? What do you mean Baruch Hashem? You, this is a mitzvah. You have to view it as a loss. Only if you see a mitzvah as a burden, as a commandment. But when you see a mitzvah as an opportunity, this is for me. This is not for God. This is for me. I want it. I don't want to lose out. And this is what these people understood. These holy people. We don't even know. The Torah doesn't list them by name. It says there were people. We, we, we speculate who they were. But uh, do we know? We don't know who they were. But... The lesson is so precious. When I love something, I'm not looking for ways out. I'm looking for ways in. I overslept. I missed a class. Am I, am I upset about it? We need to build in ourselves the mentality that mitzvot are for us. When I give tzedakah, imagine you get to shul, you see no one's there collecting. Ah, oh, we dodged one today. There's nobody here. BH, BH, we're good. Right? Or you sneak out the side door, nobody catches you. Or do I see Tzedakah? What are you talking about? Tzedakah is my way of ensuring today's paycheck. When I give, I'm getting get more, ten times more. 
I want to give. And I'm upset that I can't give. Where are the people? Let's go. People, I want to give. Avraham Avinu, he was waiting outside of his tent. There was nobody that needed a place to stay. No guests, no wanderers. Avraham was, was sad. He wanted to do. He wasn't looking for ways, ways out. Avraham wasn't looking for the easy way out. Avraham wanted to do mitzvot. And he was sad when there was no mitzvah to do. And then God had to make three people appear just to give the guy a mitzvah to do. That's how much Abraham wanted it. So how much do we want mitzvot is lesson number one. And are we happy? Are we happy when we, when we find a way out of a mitzvah? <clears throat> That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. The pasuk says in, in the end of the Torah, God forbid many curses that come to the Jewish people if they don't observe the Torah. And the Pasuk says that one of the reasons all of these curses come to a guy is Tahat Asher Lo Avata Tashem Besimha. Because you didn't serve God with happiness. Simply, it means you didn't serve God with Simcha. It means that you'd serve God, but you weren't happy. You shook Lulav, you bought an Etrog, but you were bitter about it. You spend the money on the Mezuzah, but you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this. I got to spend. What a saf thousand dollars for tefillin, oh my god, what a rip-off, the guy's making so much money, right? So you did a mitzvah, but you're like, the whole time you're resenting it, and you're, 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 you're so upset about it, so in life, you got to do mitzvah besimha, that's the simple understanding, but says Rav Simcha Bonim, Rav Simcha Bonim of Pshischa, he says like this, he says, no, 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 read it with a comma, Lo avata et Hashem, kama, besmaha. When you found, when there were times in life that you didn't get to serve God, you were besimcha, you were joyful about it. You were happy that you were exempt. You were happy that you didn't have to serve God. That's a problem. That's a problem. In life, we should look for ways to obligate ourselves. If the rabbi is not feeling good and he can't give a class, call up another rabbi. Rabbi, are you giving a class tonight? I want to come. I want to learn. If there's no minyan in your shul, get closed, whatever it is, find another shul. I want to go. I want to, This is opportunities. This is money. I should view mitzvot like, like opportunity. It's not, right? It's not something that I'm doing for God. It's something for me. This is for me. It takes life's work to create that mentality. It's a lot of work. But we got to get there. We cannot be happy. We cannot be happy when we're exempt. We got to look for ways to be hayah. That's Pesach Sheni, my friends. Pesach Sheni today is the holiday that celebrates the idea that I want mitzvot. Nice. Okay. You know, the Gemara says, by the way, that at the end of time, when Mashiach comes, the Goyim are going to come and they're going to want one more chance to try to join the Jewish people. The Goyim, that their whole life they hated us, they made fun of us. Finally, when the curtains open, when the lights go on, when the Hashem reveals the truth, everyone's going to see the truth. We are going to be on the right side of the equation. Majority of the world's going to be very surprised. Although, probably deep down, they won't be surprised. They probably know the truth. Anyways, the Gemara says that the Goyim are going to come for one last chance. And God is going to believe it or not, He's going to give it to them. Alrighty, you want it? Here you go. He's going to give them the mitzvah of, which mitzvah, anyone know? Which mitzvah is God going to give them? Sukkah. Alrighty, gentlemen, you want to, here it is. Sit in a sukkah. Alright, no brainer. Can we bring the sheshbesh, the hookah, in the sukkah? What can we do? Yeah, no problem, just sit in a sukkah. Okay. They go in the sukkah, they're sitting. All of a sudden, what does God do? He brings out the sun. It starts getting hot. Humid, sweating. Finally, it's so unbearable that they leave the sukkah. They get out. They leave the sukkah. They go back into the AC. And the Gemara says, as they leave, they just kick the sukkah. Uh, who needs it? And they leave. And the Gemara says, in conclusion, look, Hashem's going to give them the chance and they're going to fumble. They're going to mess it up. And all the commentaries ask such an obvious question. If you ever learn the laws of sukkah, there's actually a halakha that a mitzta'ir is patur misukkah. 
that a guy who's in pain because of the sukkah is actually exempt. The sukkah is one of those few mitzvot that needs to be comfortable. Most of the time we don't say that. Nobody cares if the tefillin hurts you. You still got to put it. Right? Nobody asked you if it's hard to walk to shul on Shabbat or would you rather uh, take a taxi. It doesn't matter. You got to walk. Okay? There's no leniency to drive to shul. Right? No one cares if it's hard or hot. It doesn't matter. Usually for mitzvot, you got to do it. Right? But, but, sukkah is not the case. Sukkah, if it causes you distress, you're actually exempt. Let's say you have a cold. It's chilly. You can't be outside. Go inside. You are patur. If it's raining, go inside. Why? Because the pasuk says, pasukot teshevu. You got to sit. And the rabbi say, teshevu ke'in taduru. The sitting has to be as if you're living. The same way you would live is how you have to be in the sukkah. The sukkah is your home. If your house is uncomfortable, you would leave your house. So too, if the sukkah is uncomfortable, you could leave the sukkah. That's the halakha. So the rabbis want to know, if I'm exempt from a sukkah because it's hot, then what are the goyim blamed for by leaving the sukkah when Hashem brings out the sun? They're exempt. We would also leave. Everyone's allowed to leave. So why are they getting penalized for leaving? And our rabbis give such a gorgeous answer. The problem is not that they left. That they left. That they left. The problem is their attitude when they left. What did they do when they left the sukkah? They left and they kicked. That's the problem. The problem's not the walking out, the problem is the kick at the end. The little, you know, sticking out your, your tongue. Right? That's the problem. That you were happy about it. That you were psyched that you could leave. Yes, we dodged a bullet. We got off with murder. Right? We got away with, right? That's the problem. The problem that they could kick, that means, that's the difference. A Jew leaves the sukkah, a Jew is sad about leaving the sukkah. Alrighty guys, Hashem's, Hashem's kicking us out of his home. We're kicked out of the sukkah. The Jew leaves with a heavy heart. It hurts. When we are, when we are exempt from its vault, my friends, it has to hurt us. We have to cry. Hashem, I wanted to give. Where is the people today? Right? Where are the opportunities? Opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. Okay? That's lesson number one. And lesson number two, my friends, of Pesach Sheni, and that is that in life, we have second chances. And sometimes we mess up. And sometimes we waste time. Sometimes we waste a, a, a marriage. Sometimes we lose a girl, guy. Sometimes we lose out on a house or something that was there that we could have grabbed, that we could have been living and enjoying and have a beautiful life. And sometimes, you know, we live with regret. We live with this weight of our mistakes. If only, if only if I didn't, you know, say that to my kid, maybe they would still come and visit me. If only I didn't... Uh, break up with that person, maybe we would have had an amazing marriage. If only I would have jumped on the deal sooner, I would have had that house that's now worth 10 times. If only I would have uh, gotten maybe religious when I was, you know, earlier. I could have been today, right? If only I didn't have that addiction, how much money uh, richer I would be. How much time I would have saved. If only, if only, if only... And my friends, you can't live in a holy world. In life, we cannot live in the past. We cannot live with regret. We make mistakes, and it's okay. You know, we're not meant to be perfect. Hashem didn't create malachim. He created people. And part of being human is making mistakes. And making mistakes is not the problem. The problem is allowing those mistakes to drag us down. A mistake is something that we learn from. A mistake is something that we see we take it in, we learn a lesson, we sit, we mourn, we internalize it, and then we got to get up. We got to get up. That's, that's the Jewish approach to, me, to, to mess ups, to mistakes, to loss, to tragedy. We sit Shiva, we sit for seven days on the floor, and then we get up and we move on. We have to take a moment 
absorb the pain, internalize the pain, learn a lesson, sit on the floor, realize you messed up, realize what you did wrong, and then you got to take that, and then you got to do something tomorrow differently. But you got to get up and do something tomorrow. Do it differently, but you got to get up. And many people don't get up. Many people get stuck in the past. Many people get sucked into regret. They stay living with the mistakes of their, of their childhood. That's not a Jewish concept. Hashem created something called Teshuvah. Teshuvah means return. Teshuvah means repentance. Hashem created something called a second chance. And we believe in second chances in Judaism. We believe in Teshuvah. We believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us, gives us a break. He allows us you know, to, to try again. We could try again. No such thing as set in stone. Even a decree. Even a decree that was, that was set by God. Even if God made a promise on Yom Kippur that He's going to do X, Y, and Z. You know what? We could change it. There's Pesach Shani. I have, a, I have another chance. I could figure it out. I could, I could pray. We believe in prayer, my friends. What is prayer? Prayer is me turning to God and saying, God, could I have an appeal? Could we have a second chance? We believe in second chances. Look at this. Gemara Rosh Hashanah, page 18. Haya Rabbi Meir Omer, Shnaim She'alu Lamita Beholian Shave. If two people go into a hospital, both have the same diagnosis. Or Shnaim She'alu Lagardom, or if two people go to the, onto death row. Ze Yarad Vezelo Yarad. One guy, same, same sickness. You could have a case where one guy ends up coming out alive and the other one does not. You could have a guy from death row comes out alive and the other one does not. We, you know, look at this, this poor boy in Iran. Hashem should give him life, long life, and should clear his uh, verdict. It should, be, um, it should go well, Bezat Hashem, and should give the family already peace of mind. But, um, you know, How come this one comes out of the hospital, that one doesn't? How come this one goes to death and the other one comes back alive? Says the Gemara, because at the end of the day, it's possible for us to change it. Says Rabbi Meir, I'll tell you why. The second rabbi says, one rabbi says, because one was a decree and one was not decreed. This one there was a gzardin and this one was no gzardin. Meaning one case there was, uh, it was stamped and the other one wasn't stamped. And Rabbi Meir says no. Rabbi Meir says even if both cases were stamped, you could pray. You could pray, you could change it. We believe in second chances. Rabbi Meir is the rabbi who teaches us what it means to have hope. That nothing is ever set in stone. Our rabbis say even if you have a sword on your neck, don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. We could always change. We could always change. Our rabbis tell us, Al ta'amin ad You should not. You should not trust yourself to the day you die. Now that means two things. That means for the bad, and it also means for the good. If a person is uh, is a tzaddik, they shouldn't assume they'll always be a tzaddik. They should never get cocky. They should never get haughty. They should never put their guard down. They should never say, it's okay, I'm good. I trust myself. Don't trust yourself. Don't, don't put that racket down. The second, until you see the W on the scoreboard, you could be up five love, five love, uh, six love, six love, and it's the third set and you're up five nothing. So, you're not, uh, you didn't win the game? You better be very careful. All you take is one break. One break. And it's already 5-1, and then he holds, and it's 5-2, and another break, 5-3. And he's got the momentum, and now he has, he wins the third set, 7-5. But that, it also means the other way. That no matter how low we've fallen, we should never say that this is who I am. This is me. This is, I'm, I'm bad, I'm stuck, I'm, I'm an addict, I can't. No such thing. In Judaism, we believe in second chances. We could change. 
We could change the decrees. Even if it was set in stone, we could change it. This is what Rabbi Meir taught us. And yes, today is his Yorzeit. Rabbi Meir Balanes, it's not a coincidence that Pesach Sheni, the day of second chances, is also the death day of the rabbi who taught us about second, second chances. Rabbi Meir Balanes is the rabbi who teaches us what it means to pray. And that's why there's a custom, by the way, that if you're, if you're trying to change a decree in your life, that we, we do something for 40 days straight, and we give tzedakah, and we say, Elaha de Meir Anenu. May the God of Meir answer us. We specify Rabbi Meir of all people. Why him? Says the Ben Yishchai. Look at the Ben Yishchai writes. Why do we give tzedakah le'lu nishmat Rabbi Meir? Because he is the guy, he is the rabbi who teaches us to believe in second chances. He is the rabbi that says you could change a decree. So when there's a decree in my life that I feel like I can't get rid of, that I'm trying to change, when there's a part of me that I'm addicted to, when there's a part of me that I can't let go of, when there's habits that I've been doing that I'm trying to get rid of, that I'm not proud of, <clears throat> can I change? Says Rabbi Meir, yes, you can. Yes, you can. So we say, Allah de Meir anenu. The Rabbi of Meir, we're reminding ourselves that there's always tomorrow, there's always another chance. There's always a Pesach Sheni. So this is, um, that's what today is all about. Today is realizing that we may, maybe we made our resolutions, maybe we made our promises, maybe we made our vows, and then here we are, we're looking at ourselves in the middle of, you know, uh, May, summer's coming up, and look at my life, look at me, how, how did I fall? Usually life goes on, you're supposed to grow, and look at me, I feel I'm going backwards over here, going the wrong way. Pesach Sheni. Don't worry. It's okay. It's okay. There's always second chances. Whatever we messed up yesterday, let's start today. Let's try today to be better. God, God is ready to forgive the past, but the question is, are we? Can we let go of what the mistakes that we've made? Can we get up? Can we move on? And um, Pesach Sheni shows us that it's okay, sometimes in life we're tameh, sometimes we're impure, sometimes we did things that cause us to miss out on Pesach. God says, don't worry, Pesach Sheni. You know, you wish you started learning when you were younger, it's okay. Start learning now. And you'll see, sometimes God has interesting ways of making it up to us. Yeah, <clears throat> we have a certain si'ata dishmaya, there's certain sometimes assistance in learning that we get that we could learn much faster. Our heads are much more clear. We make up time. <clears throat> so don't worry about the time that was lost. Let God figure that part out. You just, from today on, what's the best decision, what's the best thing that you could do from today on? You can't go in the past. <clears throat> you don't have the Infinity Stones from uh, Avengers, right? What are you going to do? You only could go forward. You don't have a choice. And so Pesach Shani tells us that we can grow, we can change Bezrat Hashem. So, um, either way, we'll stop over here, my friends. Um, wishing you all a happy Pesach Sheni. And uh, God willing, we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.